welcome to the Human Being Human. This Podcast. is the Human Being Human. And Podcast. this is the Human Being Human. Podcast. This is the Human Being Human. Podcast. To the Human Being Human Podcast. This is the Human Being Human Podcast. The first Czech settlers took lands east of Sargent and north of Comstock. The upper part of Myra Valley, where Czechs first settled in Valley County, is bounded by a narrow line of hills on the west. They drop abruptly to the beautiful Wood Park Valley, in which place Custer County begins. This valley joins with the valley of the Middle Loop River, the northwestern part of Myra Valley, which is in reality the upper part of Turtle Creek Valley, where Custer County begins, rises and forms tablelands and rough rolling country. Inasmuch as the water here is deep and hard to get, the higher lands were not taken at first, and that is why the later comers, the Czechs, settled on them. Nebraska native and author Rose Rosicki, in her 1929 book, A History of Czechs and Bohemians in Nebraska. On August 27, 1856, the first permanent Czech settler in the state of Nebraska, a man named Karl Zulek, arrived in the town of Arago located in Richardson County along the Missouri River. Over the next 60 years, more than 50,000 Czechs permanently homesteaded in the Cornhusker state. By the year 1910, the number of first and second generation Czechs living in Nebraska accounted for more than 5% of the total population living within the state. It's been estimated that in that year, 1910, one-eighth of all Czechs living in the United States resided in my home state of Nebraska. My family has called the Loop River Valley in central Nebraska their home for nearly 150 years. My grandfather is 100% Czech, or Bohemian as it's often called, which means I'm 25% Czech, the largest percentage of DNA I contain. I grew up listening to polka music on the local radio every Sunday afternoon, and plenty of cherries, dumplings, and kolaches could be found at our holidays and family get-togethers. How far can you trace your family lineage back? 100 years? 200 years? 500 years, like my Marxist wife? When did your American story begin? And how long has your family lived in your hometown? My great, great, great grandfather, Joseph Batoshnik, was born in South Bohemia in Eastern Europe on February 12, 1853. 150 years ago, in the year 1870, Joseph Batoshnik, age 17, migrated to the United States. He and his wife, Katerina Lukash, were married two years later, on June 11, 1872. Their wedding ceremony took place in dreamy and romantic Spillville, Iowa. Their stay in the state would not last long, however, and in 1878, they relocated out of Iowa west to Valley County in central Nebraska. The Potoshniks were among the very first Czech families to settle in the North Loop River Valley, literally making the history books in Rose Rosicki's 1929 historical compilation. Their granddaughter, Emma Potoshnik, would marry my great-grandfather, William Modry. William's father, John Modry, 
was destined for American greatness. Having been born on July 4, 1877, in central Bohemia, arriving in Iowa in 1895. Modri, in the Czech language, means wise. In a truly wise move, John Modri lived up to his name and moved far away from Iowa, arriving in Valley County in 1899. He settled down with his wife Anna on a homestead just 12 miles west of my hometown of Ord, Nebraska. America is a melting pot, as we were taught growing up. The first use of this term, melting pot, in American literature can be found in the 1782 book, Letters from an American Farmer, by author J. Hector St. John de Crevacor. What ingredients did your family bring to the table and add to the kitchen? I'd like to take a closer look at my own family's history and background today, and the story of the Czechs and Bohemians in my own backyard. Dan, and welcome to the Human Being Human podcast. I'm your host and creator, Carrington Modry Cooper. Yes, this is my full legal name, at least for the time being. As we just learned, Modry means wise in the Czech language. Cooper means barrel maker, and is still the name of the profession today. And so, welcome to the Wise Barrel Maker Podcast. If you've made it to this point and have decided this podcast isn't for you, thanks for making it to the penultimate episode of this season. If you've been keeping notes, this podcast has taken us through liquid hot magma, volcanoes, oceans and jungles, and frozen flat water. We've looked at geography, paleontology, archaeology, and anthropology, and we dug deep into the history of the New World and Old World collision on the Great Plains. During the previous episode, we dove into the extraordinarily ordinary place I call my home of Valley County and Ord, Nebraska. In today's episode, well, check out my family history and background as we explore the bohemian roots of the Cornhusker state. If you're not a fan of puns, this episode is going to be a real gut check. (laughs) Being a human being from small-town America, especially as a descendant from European immigrants, can be a juggling act, balancing a basket of seemingly paradoxical values, traditions, and backgrounds. Perhaps nothing highlights this more than the names of Nebraska's two largest cities. Its capital, Lincoln, named after Honest Abe, who emancipated the slaves and saved the Union, and the city of Omaha, named after one of the many Native American tribes that were torn apart from their lands by the United States government and its settlers. The only perspective I can offer is this. Great countries are rarely good countries. As we've learned so far, the Homestead Act was pivotal to the growth and prosperity of the early immigrants on the Great Plains, including the Germans, Poles, Irish, and of course my family's background, the Czechs. The lack of trees on the prairie was of great concern to the people of the plains, natives and European immigrants alike. Acquiring enough wood and timber on the open prairie was of such priority that the federal government passed congressional legislation to assist with this ongoing and perpetual situation. 
timber was needed for building and construction materials, and wood and charcoal were needed for fuel and fire. Perhaps most importantly, the trees themselves provided much needed windbreaks that would help reduce the persistent winds that are characteristic of the Great Plains. Passed by Congress in 1873, the Timber Culture Act was a follow-up to the Homestead Act, passed in 1862. This Congressional Act allowed homesteaders to acquire an additional 160 acres of land if they planted trees on one-fourth of the claim, because the land of the Midwest was, quote, almost one entire plain of grass, which is and ever must be useless to cultivating man. Homesteaders faced the requirement of developing the land for five years before they could claim the property for practically zero out-of-pocket costs. Many European immigrants, including my Bohemian ancestors, took advantage of these governmental blank checks. As we left off our story, Nebraska had officially become the 37th state of the Union, and the city of Ord in Valley County had been surveyed and established as the first settlers and pioneers staked claims in the North Loop River Valley. These early immigrants came from all walks of life, including Germans, Irish, Danes, as well as plenty of Eastern European Czechs. Preparation was certainly meeting opportunity in this fertile valley. But even with this abundance of free stuff, it was not easy going initially, and these early immigrants certainly saw their fair share of challenges and struggles. Valley County was ravaged by grasshoppers in the 1870s and 80s, and bugs flourished in the 1890s. Prairie fires caused heavy loss in the first decade of the county's existence, while severe blizzards struck in the year 1880, and more famously in the year 1888. But the settlers of Valley County were tenacious and adaptive, and unwilling to give up on their new homes. It was during these tough climactic times that the growing of popcorn became a leading alternative in the valley, especially near the village of North Loop. Popcorn was a sturdy crop that required less water than corn and was more resistant to harsh growing conditions. And so, the North Loop Valley became known, even then, as the popcorn center of the world. During high school and into college, I worked at one of these popcorn farms, one of the largest on the entire planet, detasseling row after row after row of popcorn. The wages I earned plucking the reproductive organs off of these popcorn plants helped me purchase my very first drum set. The first Czech homesteaders arrived in Valley County in 1877, settling near the townships of Geranium in Michigan. My great, great, great grandfather, Joseph Potoshnik, would arrive the following year. The Loop River Valley soon became the center of a large network of Czech communities, spreading across to Valley, Custer, and Garfield counties, numbering 600 to 700 families in total. The largest portion of these Czechs lived in around the city of Ord, while the villages of Illyria, North Loop, and Arcadia remained somewhat smaller. In adjacent Custer County, more than 60 Czech families lived near the town of Sargent, Nebraska, while 75 families lived near the village of Comstock. My 100% Czech grandfather, Alvin Modry, would play football at Comstock High School during the 1940s, winning back-to-back -back state championships 
for the Comstock Pirates. Who were the Czechs, or Bohemians as they're often referred to? What country or region did they come from? Bohemians, Czechs, Slavs, all of these various groups of people called Eastern Europe their homeland for thousands of years. Why did these folks leave their homelands behind in Europe and come to the United States? And why did they settle in such large numbers on the Nebraska prairies, of all places to wind up? These questions are critical to better understanding and appreciating the way of life for Czech settlers in Nebraska, including my own family's background. Like all immigrants that came to America during the 19th century, they faced tremendous challenges in their new environments as they assimilated into the United States and its American dream, all while still trying to maintain their heritage, customs, and family traditions. Because my family is primarily Czech, we'll be taking a closer look at their background story during this episode. Let's travel way, way back and dig deep into the origins of the region known as Bohemia. By 30,000 years ago, human beings had already made their way into Eastern and Central Europe and settled onto the Czech lands. Several Paleolithic tribal cultures made their home here, subsisting on the frozen icy tundra. One of the oldest sites of human occupation found in Bohemia, the Predmosti archeological site near Bruno, is dated between 24,000 and 27,000 years old. Check out this fun fact. The 29,000-year-old figurine, the Venus of Doni Vestonice, is known as one of the oldest known ceramic statues in the world, and it was discovered in the Czech lands in 1924. For thousands and thousands of years, Eastern Europe, including the Czech lands, was a collection of tribes, chiefdoms, and eventually unified cultures ruled by various authority figures and political rulers. Although the vast Roman Empire had ambitions of conquering Bohemia, even building forts and outposts on the outskirts of the region, the Romans were never able to take over this expansive territory. Fast forward to the fall of the Roman Empire and its chaotic aftermath, a time known as the Migration Period, which began in the year 476 with the last Roman Emperor. During these couple of centuries, there were widespread invasions of tribal peoples throughout Europe and into former Roman territory, most notably the Germanic tribes that claimed the fallen throne. These migrations are sometimes referred to, especially from the perspective of the Romans, as the period of the barbarian invasions. The first Slavic people in the Czech lands in Eastern Europe arrived in the 6th century during this period of vast change and transforming cultures. According to historical texts, the Slavic people moved into eastern Bohemia in the year 530, eventually settling in the fertile river valleys further into central Bohemia. Many historians support the idea that a second and third wave of Slavic people came from the south later on during the 7th century. These loosely collected groups of cultures fought with their neighboring rivals until the rise of Samo's empire in 631, the first unified Slavic state in Bohemia. One critical historical factor shaped the culture of the Slavs in Central and Eastern Europe, the introduction of Christianity to Bohemia. In the year 863, the missionary brothers, St. Cyril and St. Methodius, on invitation from the Czech prince himself, traveled north from the Byzantine Empire into the Czech lands. Their mission? 
to introduce Eastern Orthodox Christianity to the Czechs and Slavs. Known by history as the Apostles to the Slavs, these two men were the first to translate the Bible into the Slavic language. Although Christianity was not new to Eastern Europe, the Czechs did not fully embrace the Roman Catholic Church at the time, and many modern Slavic people still practice Eastern Orthodox Christianity to this day. Eventually, though, the Roman Catholic Church extended its full authority over the majority of Europe. From the years 1004 to 1806, over 800 years, the Czech lands in Bohemia were part of the great Holy Roman Empire, which of course was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Between the years 1526 and 1804, the Kingdom of Bohemia and all the lands of the Bohemian crown were ruled as part of the great Habsburg monarchy. This royal bloodline of family rulers is best known by history for their very strong and very distinctive chins and jawlines. I'm sure that Ord's A.T. Chin Stacy would be very proud, if not a little jealous. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the Slavic and Czech peasants of the Holy Roman Empire kept the Czech language and traditions alive the best that they could, while still under control of the Habsburg monarchy. The radical new ideas of the French Revolution, carried throughout Europe by the armies of Napoleon, ushered in a renewed era of hope for these subjugated Slavic people. Although Bohemians still remained under control of the Austria-Hungarian Empire following the defeat of Napoleon, the concepts of liberty and independence remained strong among the Slavs. It was during this turbulent time in European history that an awakening among the Czech people began to rise up. Known as the National Revival, this cultural and social awakening brought a re-energized interest and expansion of Czech language and culture within Slavic communities. This rejuvenated energy traveled with the Czech immigrants wherever they settled across the great American frontier. Of course, this included the state of Nebraska and my home of Valley County. The struggle for Czech cultural identity is important for understanding those that migrated to America during the 19th century, among them Joseph Potoshnik and John Modry. Although a few Bohemians entered England's American colonies in the 1700s, Czech immigration to the United States, including Valley County, did not begin in large until the second half of the 19th century, aka the 1800s. The vast majority of Czechs immigrated to Nebraska in the decades between the European revolutions of 1848 and the founding of an independent Czechoslovakia in 1918, following World War I. Even though Bohemians were experiencing the national revival movement of their culture during this time period, political and religious reasons were not the driving forces for Czech immigration to the United States and Nebraska. Time for a reality check. For the most part, these earliest Bohemian migrants were lower class peasant farmers, and their main motives were financial and economic, primarily the worsening agricultural conditions in their rural homelands. Nationalistic Czech leaders and political figures attempted to discourage citizens from leaving the country, arguing that, quote, love of fatherland, if nothing else, should deter Czechs from emigrating. But the need for social and economic security was too strong for the Bohemians during this uncertain and unstable time period. Tales and stories of gold in California in 1849, sensationalized in newspapers and tabloids, lured many would-be travel seekers across the Atlantic. But it was 13 years later when the 1862 Homestead Act provided real incentive to peasants 
eking out an existence on inadequate Eastern European cropland. Although some Czechs also came to the United States as political refugees, their numbers were insignificant compared to the several hundred thousand farmers, ranchers, and artisans that found their way across the pond. My family of Czech farmers were among these hundreds of thousands who literally plowed their way into the history books. For the purpose of helping and supporting their growing communities on the plains of the Midwest, the Czechs organized themselves into fraternal benevolent organizations, basically community-funded insurance pools. These associations offered benefits and protections to its members in the case of illness, accident, or death. These low premium insurance and protection services had hundreds of community lodges across the United States where local members would gather for mutual community support. The best known of these was the Eastern-based Czechoslavonic Benevolence Society and its offshoot, the Western Bohemian Fraternal Association. These organizations proved to be of immeasurable assistance to the many Czech immigrants on the Great Plains who could not otherwise afford social protections for their families. One of these historical halls can still be found in Valley County, Nebraska, where one of my best friends hosted his wedding in 2014. The Rod Slavin Hall, better known locally as National Hall, is a Czech community lodge located between Comstock and Ord, Nebraska, about 10 miles from the Mosry farm I grew up on. National Hall was originally constructed in 1909 by the Western Bohemian Fraternal Association, and it historically served as a meeting place for the Czech community of Valley County and its surrounding neighbors. It goes without saying that certainly plenty of beer was drunk and polka music danced to in the lodge's over 100-year-old history. I'm very thankful and grateful that my wife and I got a chance to help keep these bohemian traditions alive and well with some of our closest friends in such a historical location. In the year 1904, Czech author Fantizik Sokol Tuma arrived in the United States, where he spent over five months traveling around Nebraska, visiting Czech communities in true bohemian fashion. In his book, Travels of America, he wrote about the small-town folks he encountered along the way. The Czechs in America are brought together only for mutual protection necessitated by lack of American social legislation. Above that, they are interested only in social gatherings, concerts, stage plays. But all their activity is not motivated for the national Czech good, but it is dependent upon other, often personal reasons and circumstances. In other words, while the Czech settlers in the U.S. and Nebraska were proud of their former Bohemian land, their traditions and practices meant only as much to them as their practicality to everyday life in America. And I think that's a succinct summary of how I feel about my own Czech background. The European history can make me go cross-eyed, but the food, music, and family traditions are why I'm doing this podcast episode. As we've learned in previous episodes, newspapers were very important in small-town Nebraska during the 19th century for both local news and news abroad, especially for these budding immigrant communities. Newspapers were the most important medium keeping American Czechs aware of happenings in the many Czech settlements across the United States, as well as developments back in their native Bohemian homelands. Between January of 1860 and the spring of 1911, 326 Czech newspapers and journals were published and distributed across the United States. Most didn't survive long and were short-lived, however, with some lasting less than a year. For the most part, their publishers and editors were self-educated 
and they were dedicated to helping and supporting the new Czech immigrant towns and cities that were sprouting up across the Great Plains. And so, progress steadily continued in the Czech communities of the Loop River Valley, even in the face of droughts, blizzards, and prairie fires. This is a testament to the willpower and work ethic of the early folks of Valley County. Not only were these homesteaders growing their crops and raising their animals, but new businesses, public services, and other critical infrastructure were laying their foundations across the fertile region. In the fall of 1877, W.H. Mitchell moved his newspaper, the Valley County Herald, from the once budding but defunct Calamus Township, where he began its publication in a small log building. The Ord Quiz newspaper, the only surviving paper to this day, was established in 1882. These early newspapers were vital to the early Czech communities of the North Loop River Valley. In the spring of 1878, the year my great-great-great-grandfather and his family arrived in Valley County, a hardware drugstore and two blacksmith shops were constructed, and two law practices were established in the flourishing city of Ord. That same year, John Drake and Company constructed a brickyard business, and 100,000 bricks were manufactured in the first year alone. All in all, around 35 buildings were constructed in the early 1880s, with more than half of them businesses. Among them, this included the Ord Flouring Mill, which was built for $5,000 in 1881, or roughly $125,000 in today's dough. By the end of 1882, Ord's population had increased to over 500 people. A branch line of the Union Pacific Railroad from Grand Island, Nebraska, reached Ord in the year 1886. Soon to follow was a line of the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad, which came up from Aurora, Nebraska, roughly 100 miles to the southeast. Across the Great Plains, the earliest village settlements began growing and flourishing in the late 1870s in eastern and central Nebraska, particularly in the counties of Fillmore, Saunders, Butler, Colfax, Knox, Custard, and of course, Valley County. These budding communities provided the good life the Czechs worked for and desired especially since their lives as settlers and ranchers were difficult and physically challenging. They did their best to recreate the atmosphere of their bohemian homes as they fondly remembered them. Houses were adorned by colorful flower beds. Vegetable gardens full of cucumbers and dill were planted in backyards. Benches lined Main Street where older citizens could sit and chat. And concert halls conducted numerous plays and musicals. Of course, plenty of home-brewed beer was drunk and homemade kolaches eaten while polka music played on stage and folks danced the night away. Perhaps it's in our DNA, or perhaps not, but some things never change. The Czech-American setting on the plains of Nebraska gave them security and satisfaction and they enjoyed their new homes and social lives. They viewed their communities gratefully and were proud of their accomplishments on their new lands. And through all the ups and downs, Bohemian customs and traditions still prevailed and were kept alive by these close-knit villages and cities. Folks like my great-great-great-grandfathers and their families spoke Czech within their households as well as on the city streets. They danced to Czech polka and waltzes, cooked bohemian dishes, and they read newspapers printed in Czech. Even upon death, a person could expect to be buried in the Czech cemetery, following a eulogy and prayers in the Czech language, all spoken to the sounds of Czech music, playing softly 
in the background. And it is here that we leave off today's episode. As the dawn of the 20th century approaches, Nebraska's map is dotted with thriving communities of Czech immigrants, from the sand hills of western Nebraska to the eastern Missouri River. Folks that once lived in sod houses and attended school in hillside dugouts now found themselves connected in a world powered by petroleum and electricity from coast to coast. The role of the man on the Great Plains would continue to evolve and expand as new public institutions were created and established. In the fall of 1890, a group of young college men competed in a brand new type of game brought in from the Ivy League schools out east. On November 27th, Thanksgiving Day 1890, the University of Nebraska at Lincoln played its very first game of college football, winning 10 to nothing against the Omaha YMCA. After completing its first 1890 season undefeated, this pioneering game of grit and dirt would forever transform the state of Nebraska and come to define my home. Please join me for the next episode as we tackle the fabled history of Nebraska college football. Thanks once again for listening to the Human Being Human podcast. I'm your host and creator, Carrington Modry Cooper. Please join me for the next episode, and we'll see each other on the other side. You can follow this podcast on Facebook, Twitter, as well as Patreon. I'll be posting links to all the references mentioned throughout this series, as well as any other stories, videos, articles, or other cool stuff that might be of interest. Today's episode featured music by my current band, Motion Trap, and the song Molecule. Although Motion Trap is based out of Denver, Colorado, our band is composed of three central Nebraskans. As always, I appreciate all of your ears and support. Good day, good morning, good night, and dobri den.